Hi. I want to start out by by telling you how I ex expect you to use these lectures in our course. You have to think of these lectures as homework. You watch these lectures before the class meetings about a particular topic. Usually you'll watch it over the weekend. These lectures are going to be quick, they're going to be direct, and they're going to be very information dense. The lectures aren't very long and they and we'll have one lecture per week in this class. Uh, this means that you should probably watch these lectures in a low distraction environment. Use headphones maybe or, or, or go someplace where you can you can concentrate pretty well. And you might even want to watch it twice. You might want to come back later and use the video lecture as a reference. Now you don't have to understand everything we talk about the first time. But you should at least be able to formulate some questions about the parts you don't understand. All right, let's begin. Now, our subject for this class, for the whole semester, will be macroscopic systems. Systems that are microscopically very complicated. If you look at the details, you'll see trillions upon trillions of atoms moving around in really complicated ways. But macroscopically, on the large scale, they're very simple. So, for example, um, today we're going to talk a lot about what are called PVT systems. And these are systems whose macroscopic state of affairs is described by just three numbers. A pressure, P, a volume, V, and a, and a temperature, T. The, the macroscopic state of the system is just these three numbers. So let's examine the three state variables for a PVT system. The easiest one is V, the volume. And the key point about the volume is that it's independent of the shape that is occupied by the system. The system can be in any shape of container. Only the total volume matters. And the volume, of course, is measured in meters cubed. That's a, that's a, that'll be our basic unit of volume. The next variable we, we want to consider is the pressure. The pressure is this outward force per unit area on the walls of a container holding the PVT system. And um, uh, so it's force per unit area. That's, uh, that's going to be measured in newtons, unit of force, divided by meters squared. And a newton per meter squared is called a pascal. Now a newton is not that big a force, so a newton per meter squared is a pretty small unit of pressure. Um, the Pascal is, uh, is so small that atmospheric pressure uh, on the Earth's surface is about a hundred thousand Pascals, about 10 to the fifth Pascals. Finally, there's T, the temperature. Now we're always going to be talking about the absolute temperature, um, which is measured in kelvins. Now, Absolute temperature is related to conventional temperature as follows. A change in temperature of 1 Kelvin is the same as a change in temperature of 1 degree Celsius. But the zero of Kelvin is at this special point, absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees Celsius. So zero Kelvins is minus 273 degrees Celsius. And um, room temperature is uh, something like 300 Kelvins. Now, a PVT system may be a solid or a liquid or a gas. It, its, its phase may depend on PV and T. Um, so, in general, we'll call a PVT system a fluid. Now, one nice way of thinking about a PVT system is to imagine that we put it in a cylindrical container with a piston, um, uh, a movable piston on one side. Remember, Nothing important depends on the shape of the PVT system, so we might as well choose a convenient shape, like a cylinder. Now, because of the pressure of the PVT system, it's pushing on the, um, 
on the piston. There's an outward force, F. And that force is exerted over the face of the, of the piston, which has a cross-sectional area, A, the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. And so that means that the pressure of the PVT system, in terms of these, these other variables, the pressure is just, of course, F divided by A. So if we can measure that force, we uh, can measure the cross-sectional area, we know the pressure. And we can consider various, uh, various changes that we might um, um, allow in the gas. For example, we might uh, start out with a gas at a small volume and then allow it to, to expand to a larger volume by allowing the, the movable piston to move. And uh, we could uh, um, call that displacement of the piston delta x. And if we have a certain piston displacement, we, we can associate with that a change in the volume of the system. And it's not hard to see that delta v, the change in volume, is just the cross-sectional area A times delta x. So we can expand or contract the fluid. We can um, do this by holding, say, the pressure constant. Um, if we uh, maintain a constant force balancing the outward pressure, that would hold the pressure constant. Or we could hold the volume constant by clamping the, the, the piston in place. We could hold the temperature constant by uh, adding or taking away heat from the, uh, from the gas to maintain a constant temperature. We could allow the, the gas to exchange heat with its surroundings, or the, the fluid to exchange heat with its surroundings, or we could surround it by an insulation layer uh, and, uh, and prevent heat exchange. So all of these are possible ways we could, uh, we could change the, the uh, P, V, and T for the system. Now, um, I want to now introduce two important concepts for our study of PVT systems. And the first one is the idea of a state function. And a state function is any quantity that only depends on the state variables P, V, and T. An example would be the internal energy of the, of, uh, of the PVT system. It only depends on the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of the system. But something else like, um, like, its, uh, uh, like, like its shape doesn't depend on P, V, and T, and so that won't be considered a state function. State functions are very important. And the second concept we want to introduce is the concept of an equation of state. An equation of state is just a mathematical relationship between the state variables, that is to say between P, V, and T. And this mathematical relationship um, expresses the, the internal physics of the system. And it has the consequence that two of these variables will determine the third one. So instead of there being three independent variables, there are only two independent variables. Now, I said that the equation of state always reflects internal physics of the system. And it might be completely empirical. We might have arrived at our equation of state just by making macroscopic observations of the system. But ultimately, we'd like to have a microscopic explanation of the equation of state, an equation, uh, an explanation that involves what the atoms composing the system are actually doing. And, and um, uh, uh, that will be one of our goals, to have a microscopic understanding of where equations of state come from. Now, there are all kinds of PVT systems, and there are all kinds of equations of state. But to start with, let's take a look at a, a very simple example, the example of the ideal gas. Now, an ideal gas is a, an idealization of the real world, but, but many gases, most gases, are very close to ideal if the pressure is not too high and the, the uh, temperature is not too low. So we can develop the, uh, the laws of an ideal gas empirically. And the, um, the law in encompasses three empirical facts. And the first one is Boyle's Law, which was discovered by Robert Boyle back in the 1660s. And he found that if you hold the temperature of a gas constant, then its pressure is proportional to 1 over its volume. That is to say, pressure and volume are inversely proportional to each other. If you double pressure, you'll divide the volume in half. Now, 
The second um, empirical fact is called Charles's Law. It was discovered by Jacques Charles back in the uh, 1780s, and, uh, and he found that if you hold the pressure of a gas constant, then its volume is related to its temperature. In fact, its volume is proportional to its absolute temperature. If you were to double the absolute temperature, then the volume would expand by a factor of two. And finally, there's Avogadro's Law, um, which was discovered by Amadeo Avogadro back in 1811. And Avogadro realized that at constant pressure and temperature, the volume is just proportional to the number of moles of gas. Well, what's a mole? A mole is a measure of the number of molecules in a gas. A, 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 um, a, a, the number nu is, uh, is the number of molecules um, in terms of a fixed number in sub a of molecules in the gas. In sub a is Avogadro's number. Uh, so in sub a is like the number 12 if we were to measure things in terms of a dozen. Uh, we measure eggs in dozens, and if we have five dozens, that's five times twelve, or sixty eggs. All right, so Avogadro didn't actually know how big in sub a was. We call it Avogadro's number, but, but he didn't know what it was. He knew it was pretty big. In fact, it wasn't known how big Avogadro's number was um, for about a hundred years after Avogadro discovered his law. But what he realized was that if you had different gases made of different stuff, but two samples of gas at the same pressure, volume, and temperature, then those two samples of different gases would have the same number of molecules. And that's a very useful fact. OK, so we can put together these three empirical facts about ideal gases into one law, the ideal gas law, which is a very simple equation of state for PVT systems. And it goes like this. PV, pressure times volume, is nu, the number of moles, times R, times the absolute temperature T, where R is the gas constant. A constant of nature has a value of 8.314 joules per K mole, and, um, and R is, in fact, the same for all gases. And this is a very simple equation of state. And notice that this equation of state has units of energy. Um, on the left-hand side, for example, pressure times volume is newtons per meter squared times meters cubed, which would be newton meters or joules. Now, with the ideal gas law, we see that um, if we know any two of the state variables, we can calculate the third one. So even though the th there are three state variables, there are only two independent state variables, since given any two, we can get the third one. Now, since we know Avogadro's number, we can establish a kind of link between the microscopic and the macroscopic physics of the gas. Avogadro's number has a value um, of about 6.02 times tw 10 to the 23rd per mole. And, and that's a stupendous number. That's a huge number. And so that means that the macroscopic world that we see is a lot bigger than the microscopic world of atoms and molecules. And Avogadro's number um, provides us with a link between the microscopic view and the macroscopic view. For example, if we have a certain number of moles, we can figure out the number of molecules, a sort of more microscopic idea. Um, number of molecules in is just nu times Avogadro's number. Another constant that's important for microscopic physics is Boltzmann's constant K, which is just the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. And it has the small value of 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. And as we'll see throughout this semester, Boltzmann's constant is a really important constant and tells us a, and tells us a lot about the microscopic world. Sometimes it's easier to think in terms of, of masses rather than numbers of molecules, to measure things in grams and kilograms. And so uh, to do that, we need two ideas. One is the molecular mass, the mass of one molecule. And the other is Avogadro's number times that, the molar mass. Um, and each of these will depend on what kind of molecule you're talking about. And we can find the total mass of a gas that we have by taking um, 
um, the total number of molecules times the molecular mass or the number of moles times the molar mass and that'll tell us the total mass of the gas. And these, um, this connection between macroscopic and microscopic uh, allow us to derive other forms of the gas law, other, um, uh, other uh, uh, equivalent equations. And one of them is um, the, uh, uh, would, would go like this. Uh, it looks like this. PV is equal to NKT, where N is the, the number of molecules and K is Boltzmann's constant. This is sort of a, a, um, a form of the gas law in microscopic terms. So we'll call this a microscopic form of the gas law. We'll talk, we're talking about the particular molecule, how many molecules there are. A second thing we might do is divide the gas law by the volume, and we get something like this. The pressure is equal to uh, nu RT over V, but if we, um, if we introduce the molar mass, then we can write this as rho RT over M, where rho, that's the Greek letter rho, is the gas density. That's the total mass of the gas, nu times molar mass, divided by the volume. And so you see, this is a version of the gas law that holds not for the gas as a whole, but at every point in the gas. The pressure, the density, and the temperature are all defined at every point in the gas. And so this is kind of a, a local version of the ideal gas law. And finally, we can sort of do both of these, and, um, and, and we can arrive at, at this version of the gas law. P is equal to little n kT, where little n is the number density, the number of molecules per unit volume. Um, N over V, and that's kind of a, a version that's microscopic and local. So we have all these, these um, different forms of the gas law, but they're all really the same relation, the same physical idea about ideal gases. Okay, now that we have these equations, we could work out simple numerical examples. We could do numerical calculations. For example, consider the air in this room. The pressure in this room is about 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth pascals, about a 101 kilopascals. And the temperature is about 295 kelvins. Um, the, uh, the molar mass of, of air is about 29 grams per mole, about 0 0.029 kilograms per mole. That's a, a kind of an average between nitrogen and oxygen because the air is almost all nitrogen and oxygen. So armed with information like this, you could begin to ask questions like, what's the volume of one mole of air molecules in the room? And that turns out to be about a 40th of um, a cubic meter, pretty good size volume. Um, what's the, the density of, of the... Uh, of the air in the in the in the room, we could calculate that from another form of the uh, of the ideal gas law, and it's about about one kilogram per meter cubed. And we could uh, ask the question: um, How many uh, how many molecules are in just a, a cubic centimeter of air? And we'll find out that that uh, uh, that's about two times ten to the nineteenth molecules. Now, of course, I've given you rough order of magnitude estimates for all these numbers, but you should calculate them yourself and get more precise values. These numbers are just to, uh, to let you know if you've done the calculation right. So I suggest you do these calculations. You might even want to stop the lecture now and carry them out yourself. Now we're very interested in finding ways to keep track of and understand the changes in the state, the macroscopic state, of an ideal gas. And uh, one way to do this is to think about ways we can visualize various transformations that the gas might undergo. So let's talk a little bit about that. If we want to visualize changes in the state of the gas, it's often useful to, to think about a, a two-dimensional space that sort of describes the state of the gas. The, we'll, we'll talk about the PV plane. The idea is that if you have the two variables PV, pressure and volume, that completely determines the state of the gas. And so the state is, is just a point in the PV plane. Um, if you know that point, you can calculate the temperature, you can calculate everything important about the state of the gas.
Okay, so um, notice that we have chosen to use pressure and volume as our two variables. We could use the temperature and the volume, the pressure and the temperature, um, uh, any pair would do, but we'll, we'll choose pressure and volume, and we'll also choose to put P on the vertical axis and V on the horizontal axis. Okay, so let's, uh, let's um, um, see what happens if we change the gas. Let's imagine that we expand the ideal gas. Uh, and we can do that under, under various conditions. So first of all, let's imagine that we hold the pressure constant. So this is like uh, Charles's law. And so that means that V is proportional to the absolute temperature T. And that means that if, if uh, V increases, so does the temperature T. If we double the volume, that means that the, t the absolute temperature must have doubled. And so, uh, and so what does that look like in the diagram? Well, the pressure is constant. And so the, um, the point representing the state of the gas moves horizontally. It keeps its vertical coordinate, the pressure, constant. And so it traces out a horizontal line, a pressure equal to constant line in the PV plane. Well, of course, another thing that we might do is we might hold the temperature constant. This was the situation for Boyle's law. So what if we uh, what if we hold the temperature constant? This is what's called an isothermal process, isothermal expansion. Well, um, uh, as Boyle's law tells us, if the temperature is constant, then the pressure will decrease as the volume increases. The pressure is proportional to one over the volume. And so instead of moving horizontally, the, uh, the state of the gas in the PV plane will move in a sort of downward swooping curve like this. Um, in fact, this curve is a hyperbola. It's the, uh, it's the, the, the y equal to 1 over x sort of curve. And this curve is a line of temperature equal to a constant. All the points in the PV plane along that curve are points where the temperature is the same. Well, now let's suppose we expand the ideal gas in a different way. Instead of holding the temperature constant, let's insulate it from the outside. Let's, let's prevent any heat from being transferred to or from the gas. This is what's called an adiabatic expansion. That's a, that's a technical term in, uh, in thermodynamics. And so what happens if we have an adiabatic expansion of the gas? Well, when we do this, we observe that the temperature actually decreases as we expand the gas. The gas cools as we expand it adiabatically. And so the pressure decreases. In fact, it decreases more rapidly than it did when we held the temperature constant. So this also is a downward swooping curve, but it's a downward swooping curve that swoops downward more steeply. Well, what curve is this? It's not a, it's not a hyperbola anymore. Why does this curve have the particular shape it does? It's not a temperature equal to a constant curve. As you move along the curve, going down the curve, the temperature actually goes down. So what is it that is held constant on this adiabatic curve? Well, all of these are really important questions. This is going to be a big deal later on. But for now, I just want to raise those questions and let you think about them for a bit. Um, later on, we'll, uh, we'll uh, return to them, and we'll find out a lot about the physics of an ideal gas. The ideal gas law is really simple and important. And that's an example that uh, we'll return to again and again. But it is also important to remember that not everything is an ideal gas. Not even every, um, uh, every gas is an ideal gas. There are lots of other PVT systems with lots of other equations of state. Let's consider some PVT systems that are described by other equations of state besides the ideal gas law. Uh, in each case, we're going to have the three state variables, P, V, and T, um, lead to only two independent variables. And the third one will be determined by, by those. So for example, um, let's consider an incompressible fluid. This would be something like a liquid. It's very hard to change the volume of a liquid. and so. Um, uh, for water, for example, the density is pretty much constant under a wide variety of conditions. So that means that the volume 
is just the number of moles, the amount of stuff, times some particular volume, the molar volume, that the, the fluid occupies no matter what. And this means that, that the volume V is independent of P and T. So there are two independent variables in our incompressible fluid, our liquid. There's P and T. And then volume is just fixed. So uh, once again, we've gone from three state variables to two independent state variables, P and T. Another interesting example is uh, a bit more complicated. It's um, a, an equation of state that was proposed by Johannes van der Waals in the 1870s, and it's called the van der Waals equation. And it's uh, pretty complicated. It sort of looks like the ideal gas law, but on the uh, left-hand side, there are the, the two terms are pressure and volume changed a little bit. We have pressure plus something depending on the number of molecules and the volume they occupy. And then we have the volume minus um, the number of molecules times something called B. And this A and this B, um, these are constants that arise from the forces between molecules, intermolecular forces. And uh, th they will, in fact, depend on the type of gas that we're talking about. They'll be different for different gases. Now the van der Waals uh, equation models the behavior of gases both at high temperatures and at low temperatures. In fact, it even um, models the, uh, um, the condensation of a gas into a liquid. So let's, uh, let's uh, take this apart a little bit and think about the van der Waals equation. Let's first suppose that the volume is very large. The, the molecules have a lot of room to move around. Well, that means that this first term is roughly just the pressure, because when I divide by the square of the volume, if the volume is very large, then um, the dependence on volume will, uh, will more or less be negligible, and all that's left in that first term is the pressure. And in the second term, if the volume is large, then the, the other term involving N and B is uh, is not very important, so pretty much that's the volume. And that means that if the volume is very large, the van der Waals equation is pretty much PV is about equal to NKT. It's the ideal gas law. Which means that if you have a sparse van der Waals fluid, a van der Waals fluid in which the molecules are, are spread out over a large volume, then it approximately behaves as an ideal gas. Now let's consider a different approximation. Let's suppose that the temperature is very low. We're considering a low temperature van der Waals fluid. Well, that means that in the van der Waals equation, that term on the right-hand side, NKT, is close to zero. On the left-hand side, we have two factors. The first factor involving the pressure and the number of molecules and so on, that's uh, not particularly close to zero. It's, it's not necessarily small. So if that factor is not small, the other factor must be close to zero so that you have something small on both sides of the equation. And if that, uh, if that um, um, uh, second factor is near zero, then that means our equation becomes that the volume is about equal to NB, which is the number of moles times some, some basic molar volume, which means that if the temperature is very low, the van der Waals equation is essentially describing an incompressible fluid, just like a liquid. So, at, um, at uh, very large volumes, the uh, van der Waals gas behaves as an ideal gas, but at very low temperatures, the van der Waals fluid um, is actually much more like a liquid in its properties. So this is a very flexible sort of equation. Now, here's a um, here's a, uh, uh, another um, equation of state. This is the equation of state for a thermal photon gas. So if you had a, a box full of, of thermal radiation, um, this would be the equation of state. The pressure is just one-third times a constant A times the temperature to the fourth power. And that constant A, uh, I'll, just, I'll just show you what it is, it depends on um, various uh, uh, various fundamental constants. There's Boltzmann's constant in the numerator. In the denominator, you have both Planck's constant and the speed of light. Um, this 
equation of state is very important for um, the interiors of very hot stars or uh, the, um, the conditions in the early universe. Um, circumstances under which photon pressure is very important. But the point is not to use this equation of state yet, or, or even to use the van der Waals equation of state and so on. The point of all this is to, is to let you know that um, many equations of state are possible. That, uh, that the ideal gas is not the only game in town. Okay, so not every PVT system is an ideal gas. There are lots and lots of other PVT systems that are interesting. And there are lots of other interesting systems that are not PVT systems. They're not characterized by pressure, volume, and temperature. And we want to think about those. And so let me give you, let me give you an example of another kind of system. Let's consider a kind of rubber band system. And our, our basic picture here is that we have a rubber band. It's fixed on one end, and we, we've, we've got it stretched out. It's under a certain tension. And so the, the rubber band is characterized by three variables, still just three variables. And those variables are the tension, which is measured in newtons, the length of the rubber band, which is measured in meters, and the temperature of the rubber band, once again, the absolute temperature, measured in kelvins. So uh, um, uh, this is our, our, uh, our rubber band system. Of course, if the, um, if the force on the rubber band, the, the tension in the rubber band is zero, the rubber band has some sort of unstretched length, L0. Uh, and, and this is a very different kind of system. There are still just three variables. But, uh, but for example, a gas tries to expand. The pressure pushes outward. But the rubber band, if you will, tries to shrink. And this is true for lots of elastic materials and, and, and polymers. And so it's a very interesting kind of, of uh, slightly different um, system. Instead of a PVT system, it's an FLT system. Now, one of the most interesting equations of state for a, for a rubber band is the Guth-James equation of state, which was invented by Eugene Guth and H.M. James in the 1930s. And so let me give you, uh, give you the easy version of the Guth-James equation of state. Um, and this one holds if the, if the uh, displacements of the rubber band are small. That is to say, it's not stretched much. Um, and you get a very simple equation of state. The equation of state is that F is equal to a constant A times T times L minus L naught. And uh, A and L naught, the, the, the constant and the, and, the, um, and the unstretched length, depend on the shape of the rubber band and the, the material it's made of and so on. This uh, equation of state relating F and L and T is sort of analogous to the ideal gas law. It's the simple version of the, uh, of the law. And it has some interesting implications. For example, suppose we were to hold F constant, perhaps by hanging uh, a constant mass, um, a weight, at the end of our rubber band. And suppose then we were to warm the rubber band up. Let's, let's suppose we increase temperature. Well, according to this law, the quantity L minus L naught, the amount by which the rubber band is stretched, would have to decrease. The rubber band would have to shrink if we increased its temperature. And uh, you may recall this from a lecture demonstration that we did in class. Now, if this is the ideal gas law for, uh, for, the, uh, for rubber bands, as it were, then there's a kind of a van der Waals gas law that Guth and James also wrote down, a more sophisticated equation. And it looks like this. Um, there's a constant C and a con the same constant L0. Uh, C is not the same as A, but they are related. And, uh, and it's a, just a much more complicated relationship. Uh, and um, uh, one interesting problem, if you're interested in a, in a challenge, is to derive the first equation, the one in the box, from the second equation in the appropriate approximation. It's an excellent exercise in, uh, in linear approximation theory from calculus. It's a good theoretical problem. And along the way, you'll get a relationship between the constant A in that first equation and the constant C in that second equation. So try that out if you're interested. Okay, that's it. A lot of information in a pretty small package, but we're going to spend the whole coming week 
understanding this material by classroom discussion, by doing demonstrations and laboratory experiments, and by working problems and so on. So, so this is this is our agenda um, for our uh, our more interesting work in in our class meetings and uh, and labs and homework in the coming week. All right, let's go to it.